Hello, everyone, and good morning. My name is Sumitra Menon. I'm the Deputy Director at the NUS Center for Biomedical Ethics. I, 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 I'm Barney Young, so I'm a, a senior consultant over at NCID and an associate professor um, here at LKC Medicine. So welcome to this workshop on the ethics of human challenge st studies, which is co-organized by NCID and by the SHAPES program at the NUS Center for Biomedical Ethics. This workshop aims to explore the ethical aspects of challenge studies, both generally as well as through a Singaporean lens and then specifically a COVID-19 lens as well, which is gonna be hopefully the first human challenge study to be conducted in Singapore in the coming months. Um, we have a great, very distinguished lineup of speakers here today um, who are here to share their insights on challenge studies. The first half of the workshop will be chaired by my colleague, Dr. Owen Schaefer. Um, and as I invite him up to the stage, I'm going to briefly introduce him. Dr. Schaefer was appointed an assistant professor at the Center for Biomedical Ethics in 2020. He's currently the director of the Phase II Health Ethics Law and Professionalism Program. Owen's research interests include ethical issues raised by the development of novel biotechnologies. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to chair the first half of today's very interesting uh, session on human challenge trials. Just to give you a sense of how the event will operate, um, we'll be having our four speakers uh, give roughly about 15 minutes uh, talk each to give an overview of various aspects uh, chal and challenges with challenge trials. And then we'll have, at the end of all four talks, then we'll have a panel Q&A. We'll ask our four speakers to come up, and we'll open it up uh, for broader discussion. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, uh, let's proceed to the first talk. Uh, I'm uh, very delighted to introduce uh, Ms. Shabana Balasingham, uh, who is research lead for the Human Infection uh, uh, Study Program at Wellcome, and has been uh, leading the program since 2018, which has funded many of these uh, challenge trials uh, internationally. Uh, additionally, Wellcome funded uh, uh, WHO, uh, Wellcome has funded WHO to produce guidance for human infection studies being conducted uh, around the world. Uh, Shabana has 20 years of experience with human infection studies, uh, primarily with um, influenza HRV uh, and RSV, um, uh, working previously um, at HVivo. Uh, before joining Welcome, uh, Shabana was based in Singapore at the LKC School of Medicine, where she, uh, her the focus was to establish um, an influenza human infection study. So, Shabana, uh, please do come uh, to present your material. Brilliant, thank you. So firstly, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. I'm really excited to be back in Singapore and discussing human challenge studies. Um, so what are human infection studies? Sorry, sorry. Brilliant, thank you. Is it working? Maybe I'll just... Thank you. So what are human infection studies, also known as human challenge studies or controlled human infection models? These studies are where a healthy adult volunteer is intentionally infected with a pathogen under carefully controlled conditions. And these, they've been going on for hundreds of years. So the earliest uh, known example is, uh, or well-known example rather, is when Edward Jenner infected his young nephew, James Phipps, with cowpox to be able to demonstrate that he was protected against smallpox. So not just a great example of human infection studies, but also vaccination. Uh, pleased to say that now informed consent is a definite must, um, something that James doesn't look like he has given. Um, the other two pictures are more modern day challenge days. So the middle picture is from the common cold unit, and I'll speak a little bit more about that in a later slide. But you can see David Tyrrell infecting um, a volunteer with rhinovirus uh, intranasally. And the last picture is um, a challenge day from HVivo. So HVivo is uh, where I started my career, actually. It's a clinical research organization specializing in respiratory viral challenges. And you can see that not much has changed, actually. I hope you can see the volunteers laying down in the last picture, uh, ready to be infected with a respiratory virus. 
And you'll also notice that all the staff are wearing personal protective equipment. So this is really key. Safety of the volunteer is paramount. We want the volunteer to be infected with the um, pathogen that's intended, um, but we also want to protect the staff. So we want to protect the staff from being infected from the challenge agent that's given. And so the staff wear personal protective equipment throughout the uh, study phase. The uniqueness of human challenge studies is that the time and the dose of the infection is known. Oh, wrong way. Okay. So what defines a human infection study? Um, these use well-characterized challenge agents, and by challenge agent I mean the pathogen. They're usually produced, um, but not always, under good manufacturing practice guidelines, and they are tested to ensure that they are pure and that they elicit the infection that's intended. There should be no other suitable animal models, so the illness does not replicate sufficiently well in animals as it does in humans. The pathogen must be easily treatable or induce a self-limiting infection. And the volunteer population should be rigorously screened so that they fulfill the inclusion-exclusion criteria. Challenge studies should be undertaken after much thought, caution, and oversight. There should be a good scientific rationale and justification. Um, the value of the data obtained should justify the risk to the volunteer, and they should be conducted within an ethical framework, so true informed consent given. And also key is consultation with the public and the key stakeholders in that environment to ensure uh, trust is gained. The um, utility of human infection studies really relies on the knowing the time of infection and the dose of the pathogen. Um, they can be completed with fewer numbers of volunteers, generate efficacy data for products faster than field trials, and are generally less expensive. So they're usually phase 2A, phase 2B clinical studies. Um, and a really good part of the toolkit for looking at uh, product development. Human challenge studies should be considered when there's a waning of natural infection. And they're used to allow us to have a better understanding of the pathogenesis and the host response to the organism to provide an insight into vaccine development or product development more broadly. They can be used as a proof of concept to assess whether a product provides protection, can be used to identify correlates of protection, and have real value in de-risking product development. So allowing you to down-select those products, vaccines, which are most promising in the human infection study to be progressed into phase three trials, reducing the risk of uh, failure at, at phase three. And it can also be used um, in the, as a package of the, as part of the licensure package rather. So for example, Vaxcora, the oral cholera vaccine, was licensed by the FDA in 2016 for travelers um, going to endemic settings. So in terms of human infection studies, the majority are quarantine studies. So volunteers, once infected, remain in the unit, are confined to the unit for the duration of the study until they're discharged. But there are outpatient studies. So for example, there is a typhoid human infection study in Oxford um, in the UK where volunteers are infected with typhoid and allowed to go home. Uh, this timeline is really uh, around the quarantine phase. So prior to a quarantine human infection study, there's a period of screening, so potentially up to three months beforehand, and volunteers are screened to ensure that they fulfill the inclusion exclusion criteria, but also that they don't have antibodies or very little antibodies to the challenge agent or infection that's going to be given. And because of that long period of screening, they're also retested on admission to the unit. Um, day zero is the challenge day, so that's when the volunteers get infected, and they're monitored for up to 12 to 14 days on a daily basis. So they undergo uh, physical exams, um, examination rather, they have samples taken, uh, nasal washes, throat swabs, um, bloods, um, and they also fill in daily diary cards. Treatment is typically from day five onwards, um, and discharge varies but can be from day 11. Um, and is really dependent on whether the volunteer, for respiratory viral challenges at least, are shedding virus. If they're shedding virus, then they're not discharged until they're deemed to be not. And then following discharge, there's several follow-up visits, which can be up to a year. So in order to use human infection studies to assess products, vaccines, therapeutics, you first need to find the optimal dose um, which allows you to get an attack rate of approximately 50 to 75% um, with mild to moderate symptoms. 
So you would do that by uh, administering several doses of the challenge agent. So for a virus, maybe 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, TCRD50 in several cohorts. And as I mentioned, these volunteers are monitored daily and samples taken. So these clinical and laboratory assessments are used to determine viral bacterial load, inflammatory responses, safety, um, looking at the innate and cell-mediated immunity, all of which can help for uh, development of diagnostics, uh, but also to lose state correlates of protection. And of course, uh, you can use genomics, metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics on the samples as well. And once you have identified the optimal dose that gives you the attack rate required, 50 to 75%, that you can then use that dose sub in subsequent um, human infection studies to assess vaccines, therapeutics, etc. So what about the ethics of these studies? So there have been some terrible incidents in the past, um, and I'm sure we're going to hear some of that in later talks. But uh, World War II, um, prisoners were infected with diseases from uh, malaria to bubonic plague. Um, the Tuskegee experiment, where African-American men who had syphilis were recruited onto studies with the promise of health care and not given penicillin when it became available. And the Willowbrook incident, where mentally handicapped children were infected with hepatitis. All of these incidences enabled a, a change to the law and f ethical frameworks to be developed to ensure that actually in these studies, volunteers need to be given advice on the risk that they are undertaking and true informed consent to be provided. But surely this comes against the Hippocratic, Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, um, and the ethics of human challenge studies has been widely debated and discussed. Um, but a review by Lynch in 2012 concluded that exposure to toxicity versus infection in itself is not morally different. So there's no real difference between human challenge studies and phase one tox studies. In 2020, the WHO provided um, an ethics frame framework for con the conduct of human infection studies, both in high income settings and low income settings, with several considerations to be, to be thought through. So, is it scientifically justifiable? Are the risks acceptable? Um, considerations around the target volunteer population, um, considerations around the reimbursement for participation, uh, ensuring there's robust informed consent, and criteria for withdrawing from the study. And in fact, um, there are several WHO documents that cover human infection studies. And in 2020, the WHO also provided ethics framework, an ethics framework around uh, conducting COVID human infection studies. And in terms of regulatory guidance, many of these studies are done in high income settings, so Europe, UK, US, and there is regulatory guidance available. But with the expansion into low resource settings, there is now uh, regulatory guidance available for Kenya and in India. And Wellcome are now supporting AVREF to produce regional guidance for human infection studies in Africa. And actually, um, all of this guidance, the ethics review, the guidance available, the considerations have meant the safety record for human infection studies is actually very good. Um, for example, with the malaria and influenza human challenge studies, where about 600 volunteers have been challenged, there have been three serious adverse events recorded. All have been resolved. Um, one with influenza B and two with malaria falciparum. Um, and actually, the two with malaria falciparum was really down to the vaccine, not the challenge itself. So this is really key. The guidance that was um, available and all the considerations, the ethics reviews, the due diligence done, that was all um, harnessed in establishing the COVID challenge model, which was done in the midst of a global pandemic and really the first time this was done. And the study team used the guidance available to put in several risk mitigations to ensure that the safety of the volunteer was paramount. So for example, the uh, model developed was an infection model rather than a disease model. The volunteer population using the data at hand at the time was uh, immunocompetent young adults between 18 to 30. Um, and a Q COVID calculator was used to individually assess the risk of progression to severe COVID. And all the studies were done very close to emergency healthcare. So just to take you back very quickly to um, the historical human infection studies. So in the 19th century, uh, Walter Reed was, um, was um, pointed to study yellow fever in Cuba. And 
um, was sought to recruit volunteers from the Spanish immigrant community um, and offered $100 in, $100 in gold to those who volunteered, but also $100 if they became ill. And actually two volunteers died as, a, as part of contracting yellow fever. But what this study showed was that mosquito transmission was the cause, not person-to-person -person transmission. And they were able to put in measures that would reduce mortality significantly. And at the time, it was causing 40% mortality. But what is really interesting about this, sorry, is that, is that Walter Reed put in a, a process of informed consent. So the volunteers knew the risks that they were undertaking. And really, this is really important to see how these have evolved. So just very quickly, Common Cold Unit was set up in 1946 in the UK um, and specialised in common cold research. Uh, 30 volunteers were needed every fortnight, so adverts were put in magazines, newspapers, and it was sold as a holiday. 20,000 volunteers took part from 1946 and, until, I think, 1998. And they were able to show through these studies that actually it was a virus causing the infection. And they did this by filtering samples from infected patients and were still able to infect volunteers. And they also showed that 50% of those challenged with the virus came, um, became symptomatic two to three days after being challenged. So the modern era. So there is now a lot of interest in, in human infection studies, and the value is, is really being realized. And there are now a number of institutions that have a number of beds that can do large-scale human infection studies. And actually, I have to say, NCID, I think, out, outruns all of the other, the other three that's listed on this slide. Um, but what's really key is that they have BSL-3 containment facilities. And that was really important. During the establishment of the COVID challenge study, what was really, what was really um, difficult to understand was the lack of infrastructure to be able to run BSL-3 challenge studies. Oh, I've lost where I am. Okay. So what types of diseases are used in human infection studies? There's a whole range. There's a really nice review by Rostenberg in 2018 from parasites to bacteria to viruses. And post-2018, we now have COVID, SARS-CoV-2, Zika, group A, strep, and also a number of diseases that are now being established in Asia and Africa and Brazil. And just very quickly, lastly, the utility of human infection studies in development of, in product development. I've already spoken about Vaxcora, but there was also typhoid conjugate vaccines, which was given WHO pre-qualification in 2017 on the basis of human challenge data. So welcome are now really thinking about how can we better use the enormous amount of data that's produced from these studies to accelerate product development uh, used in the, in the licensure package uh, to ensure that these products that are efficacious can be accessible by those populations who need them the most. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that wonderful introduction uh, to some technical and a few uh, pointers on the ethical aspects of uh, human challenge trials. We're now going to uh, do a deeper dive into the, uh, some of those ethical and regulatory aspects um, with Professor Jerry Menikoff, a colleague of mine at the Center for Biomedical Ethics, also a senior fellow at the Faculty of Law at NUS. Uh, Jerry is uh, trained both as an attorney and a physician, which is a wonderful combination uh, for working in biomedical ethics. Uh, before coming to NUS, um, he was for 14 years um, the director of the OA, uh, Office of Re Human Research Protection, uh, which regulates the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. Um, so he has a, a wealth of experience and knowledge um, in research ethics uh, and will be sharing his insights on uh, certain ethical aspects of human challenge trials. Jerry? Okay. Thank you, Owen. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here. Uh, Wait until the slides get up here. So this is going to be a very high-level talk. I don't actually have a, a lot of points to make here, but I sort of uh, I think the best way to sort of think about this field is to have an appreciation of the basic rules relating to how we protect people in in research in clinical trials, and then apply them to challenge trials. So really, really wonderful topic, and and again, great to be here. Uh, Okay, am I doing that correctly? Let's see. Oh, the down one. Oh, okay, Sorry. wrong direction. Um, okay, so let's start with a proposition. Uh, society does everything possible to protect the interests of people participating in clinical trials. And basically, to understand 
how we deal with these issues, both from an ethical viewpoint and from a regulatory viewpoint. I think a starting point is to accept that this proposition is just wrong. Uh, we wouldn't be doing these sorts of a lot of clinical trials uh, if this is in fact what we really wanted to do, if we really want to protect people who participate in trials. Uh, you don't do the trials, because often you're doing the trials with some expectation that, I mean, you are imposing risks on these people. And, and it's a trade-off in terms of benefiting society versus harming people. And the complicated thing is, how do we work that trade-off? What's an acceptable trade-off? And it's a, sort of the core about sort of the ethical thinking behind all this. So a lot of what I tell you will be, again, demonstrating how maybe well, from my viewpoint, certainly, this proposition is just wrong. And the more you recognize how wrong it is, the more you understand what we are able to do. And in fact, the bottom line of, of the whole talk here, um, and it's great to have all the experts on, I'm not an expert on challenge trials. I have spent a lot of time in terms of the ethics of, of you know, clinical research. Um, but looking at challenge trials, I think it actually is nice to draw a line between two types of these trials, and that's what I'll try to do. Not exactly a black and white line, but a line based on how risky they are. Um, so to build up our, our understanding of how we have rules, what our rules do in terms of clinical trials, let's start out not in the world of research, but in the world of clinical care. And so we have the interaction between doctors and patients. Um, none of this should be particularly surprising. Doctors have a special duty in ethics and law to their patients. And the duty is to almost always, not always, but almost always, to do what is in the best interest of the patient. This is the public in general understands it. Certainly medical students learn this from like, you know, your first week or month in terms of being a medical student. Uh, above all, do no harm, do what's in the best interest of the patient. Uh, my quick take on this is keep thinking about the patient is number one. That's what the doctor is always going through the mind of the doctor in terms of doctor-patient relationship. On the legal side, and, and in terms of everything I'm saying, I think there is a large degree of overlap in terms of the message being sent on the ethics side and on the legal side. The law is just backing up what the ethics tells you. So if you breach this you know, requirement, in general, it's malpractice in countries all around the world. You could be sued bad things happen. This is not a, a new notion, dates back thousands of years. You go back to Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, all that good stuff. And also note, because we're going to get into that aspect of this in terms of clinical trials, in the, in the clinical setting, not in the research setting, the patient actually isn't allowed to waive this duty. You can't have the doctor say, hey patient, you know, I want to do some things to you that are kind of risky, but I want to learn something from it you know, absent some special rules, you can't do that. That's not going to get you out of, as a doctor, being into a lot of trouble. Okay, so now let's shift from the clinical setting into the research setting. And the basic core proposition is in my first paragraph here. Um, when you conduct research, uh, when researchers are trying to answer a research question, it can involve doing things that would not be in the best interest of the participants, of the subjects. Uh, this is very, very common in the way we do research these days. It's just in the nature of things that what you often have to do to answer a research question involves doing some things that are not in the best interest of, of the participants. And here are some examples. Um, yeah, I won't spell out exactly why these are bad for people, but they often are. So you'll often randomize people to two different treatments. Um, you will often not individualize treatments in a clinical trial. And, and the reason you do that is because you don't want noise. You want the two groups, the groups that are on arm A versus arm B, to basically be as similar as possible, except for the one thing that you're randomizing on, the one treatment you're randomizing on. Okay? You might be using tests to collect data about what's happening to them, and they may themselves impose risks. You know, they're they're risky tests. 
Um, and the results will not be used to affect the clinical care of the participants. But on the other hand, it will be very important to the researchers. This is important information you're going to collect. And finally, and again, these are only some examples of all these sorts of things, you, there may be a failure to disclose, disclose information, such as in particular interim results. In the middle of a clinical trial, the people studying the results, what's often called a, a data safety monitoring committee or board, they will discover that one arm is is doing much, much better than the other. If you suddenly told all the participants who, let's assume it's a, a cancer trial, they're going to all leave the clinical trial and then try to get the drug that, you know, seems to be looking better. So you don't tell them that. Again, that's not a way to benefit them. You're, you're hiding information that would be really, really useful to them. But that's the way clinical trials take place. So if a doctor was doing all these things to a patient in the clinical setting, it would be malpractice, it would be unethical, it would violate the patient as number one rule. But we want to allow research to take place. So we've basically developed a separate set of rules distinct from the rules for clinical practice that allow us to do clinical research. This is important to all of us. We all benefit from the knowledge that's learned. Um, and bottom line in terms of the third bullet point here, this is a, th a, a take on this that I think is correct, but some people disagree with this. What we're actually doing is, in the research setting, weakening the legal and ethical protections that people actually have when they are patients in clinical practice. And again, we do that because there's a really important goal here. We want to be able to do a sufficient amount of, of research. If we don't, we're going to, you know, the medical profession will not learn a lot of things that will actually you know, in a utilitarian viewpoint, will, will cause a huge amount of benefit to people all over society. So that's a basic assumption, actually, under our rules, our special framework for conducting uh, research with human participants. And so what are these rules actually allow to happen? They, uh, they take account of the conflict between trying to conduct the research and doing what's best for the participants. And there is, as I said, a real conflict, things you want to do in research that will not be in the best interest of the participants. And so we have specific rules that say, OK, we're going to allow this research to take place. You're going to be able to do things that may be bad to these pe for these people that you wouldn't have been able to do if we just had the rules for clinical practice. Practice, uh, but they're going to put limits on how bad these things will be for the participants. And that's what we're pretty much, I think, throughout this entire meeting talking about. What is it in terms of how bad uh, are we going to allow things to be for the participants in these trials? Um, where do these rules come from, or what are the ethical principles behind them? There's a thing called the Belmont Report in the U.S. in 1979 that has played a major role in, in creating the rules initially on the U.S. side, and I think many of the U.S. rules actually substantially influenced Singapore's rules. Um, three big points here, respect for persons, um, autonomy, this is basically that people get to make their decisions about which kind of risks they want to expose themselves to, uh, and this is usually implemented, we've already heard this beautifully explained, through informed consent. And, and we try to be really, really meticulous in the world of, of clinical trials. Beneficence, which I'm going to turn to saying a lot about because it's going to be highly relevant to the challenge trials. Beneficence, doing good for people. Uh, Non-maleficence is the flip side of it, above all, do no harm, that sort of thing. So researchers try to do as many good things as they can, minimize any harms. Third thing is justice, and that's the issue of kind of who are we helping, who are we harming, and that's a big issue in terms of the participants in these trials versus the rest of society. So we'll see how all of these three things play out um, in clinical trials and in challenge trials. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, in particular about a specific part of the rules in the United States because I'm most familiar with these rules and I actually think they're a little more explicit than the Singapore rules. I don't think conceptually they're all that different, but I will actually play in detail with one particular rule and it's spelled out here. Uh, it's talking about the risks of subjects, the benefits to subjects, and the importance of the knowledge that's learned. And I'm going to actually, again, play with this in, in almost an equation-like way for a few minutes. 
So let's do that. And I've, all I've done is taken that rule and turned it into an equation, and this is pretty much the equation that it is. Um, you're comparing, okay, so we're talking about a, a review committee, a thing called an institutional review board, uh, that before any type of clinical trial, and most of them can be conducted, it has to get approved by this type of committee, and this is one of the key rules that the committee has to find will be met, and we're going to discover this is the key rule that's going to determine which of these challenge trials are, are okay to go forward. And basically, it's, you know, getting to that beneficence, non-maleficence issue, it's it's giving the, the IRB three factors to look at. And basically, the benefit side has to outweigh the risk side, which makes sense, right? We want to go forward and, and do good things, okay? So if there are more risks than there are benefits, that's bad. Note in this equation, there actually isn't any upper limit on risks to subjects. So in the world where I come from, you actually could create really, really risky clinical trials, uh, and we'll talk about that, but it's relevant. There isn't any risk. These are the U.S. regulations. They do not have a cap on the risks you can impose on, on research subjects. And notice, due to that benefits to society term, you could actually have the risks to the subjects being much, much greater than the benefits to them. There may be no benefits to them. Um, so these are the things that we're going to look at and, and see how relevant this is to the world of of challenge trials in particular. Um, so now I want to just tell you in the real world, how is this implemented? What do these review committees actually look at? Because I think this will help you understand where challenge trials are at. Benefits to society, which remember is one of the terms here, are hard to quantify. All of these things actually are hard to quantify because you're, you're requiring these entities to almost sort of put a number on those three things, the risks and the two benefit things. And so given how hard it is in particular to put a number on, we don't even know at the start of the study because you don't know what you're going to learn. Um, leads to two common behaviors, particularly on the more conservative IRBs as they review this. They're going to emphasize very good informed consent, particularly in the riskier trials, and they're going to assume benefits to society are often close to zero. Um, again, this is being conservative, so what does that do to our equation? You've, you've zeroed out the benefits to society, then you get this notion that, well, gee, risk to subjects, should it sort of be in the ballpark of benefits to subjects? Um, and in a study that has no benefits to subjects, the risks are close to zero. In other words, IRBs are going to be reluctant to approve studies that have no benefits if there are very substantial risks. Um, now, for decades, you've already heard about this, there have been many clinical trials that have potentially exposed subjects to a variety of, of conditions, malaria, et cetera. And bottom line, those are not particularly controversial in the world of clinical trials these days. They were designed so subjects would be exposed to very low likelihood of dying or long-term morbidity. That's the big ticket risk that we're talking about here. And even conservative IRBs were able to approve these. Um, and so if we go back to our equation, you know, risks to subjects are kind of in the ballpark of, of um, building in again the benefits society. What I want you to think about, what if there are circumstances in which the benefits to society from doing a particular trial might be huge, particularly a challenge trial, saving millions of lives? If that were true, the equation would actually allow, from an ethical and regulatory viewpoint, approval of a study, even if the risks to subjects were very, very large, including a non-trivial chance of death or permanent morbidity. Um, and I would call those higher risk challenge trials, and they could be both ethical and legal. From my viewpoint, not clear that any such studies have occurred. I give you an example I wrote about in the U.S. We were talking a lot about these sorts of trials uh, way back in post 9-11, where there were actually a, a lot of concerns about anthrax attacks, and I mean, a lot of people hate the U.S. in the world, and, and all these attacks might occur. And here's an example. If there was a serious threat that we some other country might expose the U.S. population to some lethal chemical agent. What about, you know, doing a smallish trial where people consent to be exposed to that toxic agent, even if we knew many of them might die? And I think that's not an implausible type of high-risk challenge trial that people might actually think about. Um, 
During the early days of COVID-19, you've already heard about lots of things that were written by the WHO and others about this. Uh, and people, I think, were indeed thinking about these high risk types of trials uh, for studying COVID-19. Um, and I think it was plausible to think about it. I'm not aware that anything in this realm of risk actually got conducted, but that's what people were thinking about. Um, the challenge trials that are being discussed during this meeting, by and large, I think, are more of what I call the lower risk ones, where, and, and you ought to, if you haven't looked it up, look up Imperial College COVID challenge study, whatever it is, the consent form. It's wonderful. It, like 30 pages and it spells out how low the risks are and the risks again are in the trial that probably Singapore, I don't have any inside knowledge, is probably thinking about conducting, are very, very low, similar to the challenge trials that have been conducted in the past. So the bottom line is almost all of the challenge trials that have been conducted in the past and the ones we're talking about even in terms of COVID-19 are the lower risk types of challenge trials. They're very different than this higher risk type challenge trial, which is still something to think about in the right circumstances. If we're exposing 100 people to real serious risks and we may save hundreds of thousands of lives, that's actually still out there as being a legitimate thing to do. Uh, and I'm just going to end up, uh, this is a book I wrote years ago um, that actually discusses a lot of this in more detail. So I'm out of time. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Jerry. And now con to continue some of the ethical uh, discussions and analyses, I'm very uh, happy to be able to introduce uh, Professor Peter Singer. Uh, Professor uh, Singer um, is, is a world-renowned ethicist. Indeed, some journalists have referred to him as, the world, without, with some good justification, the world's most influential living philosopher. Um, he has worked in many different areas of practical ethics. Uh, since 1999, um, he's been the Ira W. D. Camp Professor of Bioethics at the University uh, Center for Human Values at Princeton University. Um, he first became widely known in, the, in 1975 for the publication of Animal Liberation, but since then uh, he's written on a wide variety of topics, including um, through his uh, prominent work, uh, Practical Ethics. Um, he's gone through several editions now, um, and several other works, including the Expanding Circle, How Are You to Live, um, The Life You Can Save, uh, and Ethics in the Real World. I'm very happy to invite Professor Singer to come and share his insights with us. Professor Singer. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, get the right slideshow up. Yep. Good. Thanks very much. Okay. So um, we've already had a couple of very interesting presentations about uh, human challenge trials, and I'm pleased to follow on with that. Uh, some of this may now be uh, a little familiar, so we already had an account of what human challenge trials are. Uh, I've picked the um, World Health Organization's statement from 2017, um, which talks, actually seems to limit human challenge trials to an infectious disease organism, but as Jerry just indicated, that's not really a necessary condition of a human challenge trial. Uh, you could imagine it being a toxic chemical agent, uh, as in the example that he gave, um, and you would still have essentially the same factors uh, at play. Um, but uh, yeah, they're intentional, uh, in intentionally challenging people with something that is at some risk um, uh, and which they are, uh, we are going to learn things from, and uh, that's the most uh, important factor there. So um, I want to mention uh, what to me was uh, you know, something that has really, in a way, changed the um, calculus of, of risks and benefits, and that's the emergence of the organization One Day Sooner, started by uh, Josh Morrison, who was an effective altruist, somebody who was part of this movement that began maybe in uh, around 2008 or 2009, of people who believe that um, acting altruistically, acting for the good, of the good of others, making the world a better place, should be one of our aims in life. Uh, not expecting people to devote themselves 100% to that, that maybe is a little too saintly to expect of most human beings, but that at least that, that should be something that we regard as a good and worthwhile thing to do with our lives. Um, and as an example, Josh Morrison, in fact, had donated a kidney to a stranger, motivated simply by the fact that 
the chances of dying from the fact that you only have one kidney rather than two are very low, estimated to be around one in 3,000. Uh, whereas the benefit to somebody who is on a waiting list, and of course there are lots of people on waiting lists to receive a kidney, is, is very great. Um, so that's a, a somewhat extreme example of, of effective altruism. But um, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, Josh was moved by the idea that the sooner we could get a vaccine, the more lives that would be saved, an effective vaccine. And that's why he set up, together with some other effective altruists, the organization called One Day Sooner. Now, this is just a clip from their website. Um, don't bother trying to read the small print. I'll give you that in a moment. But this, is, uh, this was just this week. I, I checked the website. They currently have 42,117 volunteers, people who have contacted them and said they are available for, or potentially available, maybe we should say, it would obviously depend on the circumstances, potentially available to take part in human challenge trials. And they come from 160 different country, countries. So this is not something that is limited to a small number of countries or one particular uh, culture, but it's something that seems to be fairly widespread, that there are a significant number of volunteers who see taking part in a human challenge trial as something that is worthwhile for them to do, that they are actively volunteering to do. Um, and at this stage, at least there is, uh, on the website, there's no indication that they will be financially compensated for doing so. So it really is altruistic volunteering. Just to um, blow up the text that you can't read in the blue box, this is what it says. It's the mission of One Day Sooner advocating for the interests of participants in intensive infectious disease trials to help test vaccines and enable other medical advances. Much of the work involves human challenge studies, and you know what they are, we've already said that. So um, that's what the organisation is trying to do. Um, but of course, it's, it's, it's not only trying to protect the interests of participants, it's also trying to provide the opportunity for participants, people who are willing to do that, to connect with the research teams who want to do that. Okay, now so one big question that comes up when we talk about this is, well, aren't we exposing them to some risk? And isn't that a bad thing to do? For example, it's already been said, isn't that contrary to the Hippocratic Oath principle of do no harm? Um, and you know, how, how great a risk can you legitimately expose people to? So, um, I wrote a paper together with uh, Richard Chappell, who um, is somebody who was, was a, a graduate student in philosophy at Princeton University, and I uh, contributed to supervising him there, but is now um, an associate professor in the philosophy department at the University of Miami. And uh, I should acknowledge, I think uh, Richard was the first one to suggest this as a principle, um, but we co-wrote the paper putting it forward, uh, the principle of risk parity. Um, it's not necessarily the final answer to this question about risk, but it's something that I think gives you a baseline where you can say, um, if the principle of risk parity is satisfied, then it is legitimate to impose that risk on uh, the human volunteers, the fully informed human volunteers. So this is the principle. We do require, for example, in COVID again, we required people to put themselves at some risk. We required healthcare workers in particular to continue to come to work even though they ran a high risk of infection. Um, and we did that at a time when there were no vaccines. So the high risk of infection could lead to death um, uh, and to serious risk of that. So, if we we're doing that, and it's not only healthcare workers, there were others who were in essential services who we also we put at somewhat high risk, those who were exposed to um, large numbers of people, uh, for example. Uh, so, so there are a variety of people at, at risk, but let's take healthcare workers as the example. If we think it's legitimate to say to healthcare workers, sorry, um, you can't just decide to take a vacation now because COVID has hit, um, we need you and uh, you have to come to work, or at least you'll lose your job if you don't. Um, uh, 
if we're prepared to say that to healthcare workers, then we should not refuse to allow research participants to voluntarily take on a comparable level of risk for a comparable or possibly greater benefit. So um, you might ask, well, how do you reconcile that with the um, Hippocratic Oath, or how do you reconcile it with um, perhaps the, uh, the de Declaration of Helsinki, which is a more modern version of the kinds of things that uh, Jerry was, was talking about in terms of uh, the priority in uh, undertaking medical research. Sorry, that seemed to skip one. Um, the priority of um, protecting the rights and interests of individual research subjects. Now, I want to say, um, before I go on, that you know, that might be challenged. I think uh, Jerry very reasonably challenged uh, that in his talk. And I'm not disagreeing with that, that there could certainly be extreme circumstances in which you simply cannot make your absolute priority the protection of individual research subjects. The cost is going to be too great. Um, but for the purposes of the argument, um, Richard Chappell and I wanted to argue that even compatibly with this principle, says the goal can never take precedence over the rights and interests of individual research subjects, you could make an argument that um, using fully informed volunteers was not contrary to the interests, uh, rights and interests of the individual research subjects. And this is the way in which you could do that. The question is, what do we consider to be the interests of research subjects, of volunteer research subjects, and who should decide what those interests really are. So um, I would argue that people's interests should not be too narrowly uh, conceived. So yes, of course, we have interest in continuing to be healthy, in avoiding premature death, uh, no question that those things are in our interests, but we may also have interests in contributing to making the world a better place. I think effective altruists do regard that as one of their interests. It's something that will make their life more meaningful and more rewarding if they can, can contribute to that. And there may be circumstances where they can make a very significant contribution to that. Um, take the COVID pandemic at a time when there were no effective vaccines. The COVID pandemic globally, um, over the first two years, uh, 2020-21, killed, uh, according to the WHO estimates, about 15 million people, or 15 million deaths associated with it. If you divide that over the number of days in, um, in two years, you get something around 20,000 deaths per day. And that's the point behind the name One Day Sooner. If you get the vaccine out there in the world, giving it to patients one day sooner, you are going to save a lot of lives. You may not save 20,000 lives because the vaccine may not be 100% effective. Um, and of course, there will be distribution problems as to when these things can happen. But it's not going to get, you know, it took a very long time to get to the entire global population at risk. But still, it's reasonable to say that if you get the vaccine, an effective vaccine one day sooner, you, thousands of lives will be saved by that. So, if you contribute to research that does that, and let's say you're one of a relatively small group, it might be um, it might be 100 or so, whatever it is, you could well feel that that was something really important that you had done with your life to make that contribution. So I think it's reasonable to say that for somebody who is concerned about uh, the world as a whole, it is in their interests to participate in this kind of research. And so um, I don't, and I, I think you could say if they are giving fully informed uh, consent voluntarily, then it is not violating any of their rights. So that's why I think that the, the statement that I gave you of the Declaration of Helsinki um, can in fact be satisfied. You are giving precedence to protecting the rights and interests of the research subject because contributing to very important, highly beneficial research um, can be with uh, an important interest of one of those subjects. 
and of course, if you come to the second question, who, sh who should decide what a person's interests are, I think that for when we're talking about people with the capacity to give consent, not children, um, as possibly not in the, in the Jenner case um, that we started with, um, and uh, people who are mentally competent, uh, then I think it's clear that it's, it's the competent uh, adult individual who is the one who should decide what their interests are. So I don't see a problem um, with uh, having to say, you know, we've got to override this or we've got to change it. You know, maybe we should in, in some extreme cases, but um, we don't have to for the kinds of cases that we may be faced with, including the COVID case. Okay, so um, let's just say a little bit about uh, another objection, and that is that you can't really have informed consent when you don't know what the risks are. Um, if there are unknown risks, can there be informed consent? I think that it's a mistake to say that the possibility of unknown risks means that there can't be informed consent because uh, there's always some degree of unknown risk. You know, you're, you're, you're doing an experiment after all, you're trying to break new ground in various ways. Um, you cannot know all of the risks and there's many cases in which we do things without knowing all of the risks that we're doing it. Um, and I think what we should understand as informed consent here is both that the person is, um, is informed about all of the known risks and is informed that there may be unknown risks. And of course, sometimes there may be you know, unknown risks where we, don't, we can't quantify, but we have a rough idea of what the risks might be. The patient has to be informed about that. And they also have to be um, informed about where we don't really know what other kinds of risks might be. So I don't see this as an insuperable obstacle to getting informed consent. And uh, finally, and I'm almost out of time, let me just summarise what I've been saying. I think human challenge trials are ethical when they're based on good science with a prospect of achieving great medical benefit and they're conducted on volunteers who meet these requirements, and this may not be a, a complete list, but they seem to me important ones. They're competent adults, where competence includes the capacity to adequately understand the info information they will be given. So I do think that's pretty important, actually, in this area. Um, maybe the standards of what competence is varies with the area that we're seeking consent in, and in some cases where the science is, is complicated and is not easy to explain even the known risks, we might want to limit ourselves to people of a certain educational level, educational competence, rather than just anybody who is competent in the legal sense of um, being competent to make decisions. Um, they're fully informed about the trial and the risks they are running, and they volunteered to take part in the trial without being under duress of any kind. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for that um, from Professor Singer. Um, a lot of food for thought, and again, we'll return to some of these topics uh, during the Q&A panel um, after our next talk. Uh, and for our fourth talk of the first half of the session, I'm very um, happy to introduce um, online uh, Mr. Jake Eberts, uh, who is the Communications Director of One Day Sooner, the organization that Professor Singer just introduced. Um, One Day Sooner, uh, as was noted, is a public health nonprofit that advocates for healthy human research subjects, particularly for uh, human challenge trials. Um, in addition to, to being the communications director, uh, Mr. Eberts also has um, the wonderful first-hand knowledge uh, of having participated himself as a participant in trials for Shinghella and the Zika virus. Uh, Jake is uh, currently, I believe, in, in, in D.C., uh, so has to come online. But thanks very much, uh, Jake, for joining us, and look forward to your talk. Jake. You can hear me? Are we good? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I am super excited to be here. I uh, apologize for any uh, wobbliness in the connection, and thank you to the uh, center's IT team. Uh, I am from DC, but currently offsite uh, outside of the United States, and so we're, we're working with what we can here. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, and uh, let me know on the auditorium side if we are good to go there. There we go. So, going to... Oops. All right, we good? I'll take that as yes. 
Um, okay, so my name is Jake, like I said, uh, and uh, as I was introduced, I am a former human challenge participant myself. Um, Shigella, which as many of you may know, causes dysentery, uh, and more recently for the Zika virus. Um, I should always disclaim uh, that I'm just one person, um, you know, as a communications director for One Day Sooner, happy to talk about kind of our view institutionally, and it's a view that we try to reinforce with regular contact with volunteers, um, but I cannot claim to represent the mantle of the thousands and thousands of people who have done uh, human challenge trials uh, over time. I'm not that bold. I should also disclaim that I do not get diseases uh, as a condition of my employment. That would definitely be uh, a problem. <laughs> These are um, something I do of my own accord. Um, as you know, I can skip through this for the most part because Professor Singer did a wonderful job, um, very uh, flatteringly describing us. We, you know, or, uh, origins come from COVID-19 challenge. One thing I do think that is important for us to emphasize uh, is that we do not take funding from industry researchers. We have no financial stake in the outcomes of trials that we promote. Uh, most of our funding comes from philanthropic sources and it can be viewed on our website. Uh, and just a little bit more about myself. Uh, I focus a lot on participant recruitment, engagement, um, and research ethics, particularly in the context of the human challenge studies uh, and other you know, intensive infectious disease studies. Uh, my purpose for the next kind of 10 or 15 minutes is going to maybe be a little skew a little bit more practical um, and, and talk about ways that particularly Singapore considers running human challenge studies um, that they can, I think, position themselves best for uh, both participant engagement and, and the kind of broader ethical implications of that. So, um, Generally speaking, kind of to summarize literature and, and what Wendy Sooner has found, there are two overarching sort of uh, uh, motivating factors that are most salient when it comes to someone volunteering, I would say in early phase vaccine research uh, and especially in human challenge studies. And that's, you know, altruism and compensation. Um, one thing that I think is really critical to keep in mind is that these are not exclusive. Um, they often fall on the spectrum. I know people who have donated all the money they've received from volunteering in a human challenge study uh, to charity. I have, I know people who could not care less about the outcome of the vaccine or whatever is being tested and are just there for the check. Uh, and in either case, in both cases, uh, those people are properly informed. Uh, I don't see a, necessarily a problem with that. Um, one thing I'd also like to, to kind of zero in on and uh, is that for particularly people, you know, who come in with uh, the idea of compensation, who are motivated by compensation, it's pretty easy to fulfill, I would say, your, your obligations to them. You pay them fairly and pay them on time and you, they go on their way and you treat them otherwise fairly within the context of, of the study and the parameters laid out by the IRB. Um, for altruistic participants, I think it, it there is a degree to which, um, you know, efficient scientific practice is owed to participants who partake in, in medical research. And that's true of human challenge later in general. When I volunteer for a study, I, for instance, to get dysentery, uh, I am taking, I am uh, placing my trust in the institution, not only to protect me, but to uh, make most use of the scientific knowledge that is gained there and to not squander it or uh, uh, you know, be running the study for frivol a frivolous purpose. And I can't, I do not have the capacity as a lay person to assess whether or not that is actually going on. Uh, and so I would argue it is incumbent on the research institutions themselves to make sure that what is being done is important. And I think that's something that's pretty obvious in many ways. You know, we the purpose of research reviews to make sure that uh, you're not doing research that is again completely frivolous. But I do think it gets a little bit more uh, more complicated. Um, I talk to my friends all the time and say that if I had joined the Shigella study and gotten dysentery, which I can tell you is not a fun experience, I don't regret it at all. But dysentery, do not recommend it. Um, and at least getting it, you know, for uh, if you're not doing it for good reason. Um, and uh, I would be really, I would be irate, actually be enraged if I learned that, for instance, that study had succeeded, that the vaccine worked. Uh, and that someone somewhere was just sitting on a batch of them and just decided not to make any more because it wasn't going to be profitable. I'd, I'd be personally pretty aggrieved, actually, because I feel like I got dysentery for nothing at that point. So I think that the, the ethical obligation actually extends far down the chain in terms of how that research goes. Um, one sort of overarching thing that we have noticed in our work at One Day Sooner, and I noticed a lot in our conversations, is the really substantial divergence of concern, what I call loci of concerns um, when it comes to research oversight, broadly construed, and participants. Um, and some of those divergences make sense. Uh, they could be systematic from the perspective of the IRB or REB uh, versus if I'm a participant, what I care about is much more necessarily individualistic. Sometimes though, I think that diverging gets the, that divergence gets a little bit concerning. And I think that, um, that there are ways that research oversight, uh, again, speaking generally here in our experience, interaction, interacting with um, oversight in the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, uh, and, and other countries um, can be a little bit frustrating from the perspective of a participant. Um, and that's often because research ethics is more conservative in a way that is not necessarily constructive. 
Um, the two kind of sub bullet here are uh, the sub bullets here are first that really important to keep in mind um, that if it is strange or bizarre, it does not mean it's an unethical. And that is something that I think that a lot of research oversight uh, has a hard time digesting. And the second is um, that, you know, admittedly, there's not a good way to consult prospective participants for a reality check on what you're doing. You know, it's impossible to identify with certainty who's going to take part in any given study. Um, and so uh, there is this kind of void, one that, you know, again, shameless self-promotion here that Wendy Sooner tries to fill to help, um, you know, guide people along in these really complicated decisions, especially when they're not familiar with, you know, when they're not an institution that has a lot of experience with something as ethically complex as a human challenge trial. I'm um, going to go through a little bit of a Venn diagram just to give, an, uh, again, some more practical sort of, uh, uh, I would say, advice here. Um, so the things on the left are what my, I think I hear a lot from research oversight, disproportionately more, far more than I hear from participants. Um, and some of these are very important, data protection in the informed consent documents I've seen, the ones I've received. I've several pages of how we're going to protect your data and encrypt it and make sure that hackers don't get to it, which is very important. It, it is very low on the, on the I would say, the, the list of priorities internally when someone is considering signing up. Uh, and that's because we just, I think, maybe assume that that's the case, that you're not just going to you know write all of our sensitive medical information on a post-it note and stick it on your office window. Um, standard of care, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, again, there's a lot of trust that it goes into signing into research up for research like this. And uh, part of that trust is, uh, understanding that, for instance, ciprofloxacin versus amoxicillin, like that's the way you should go. Like the, the thinking is has been done already, uh, and that you know you are truly uh, positioned to be, receive the best care possible. Not that again, participants don't care about that, but it's just not something that we often are in a position to judge. And then a lot of concern uh, concern over advertising and recruitment. Um, so much consternation about whether or not this bolded font is inappropriate or something like that, which is is a I think comes from a good place, but often speaks to the way that um, sometimes regulatory uh, ambiguities can lead to a lot of um, concern from the part of researchers and ins their institutions. But again, often I think in a very bizarrely paternalistic way, um, assumes the worst of, of participants um, or prospective participants even. Um, if you know, otherwise, I think that it's a little bit difficult to kind of mislead people in a seriously uh, concerning way. On the right side, um, of things that don't pop up, uh, things like daily conditions. You know, I have a participant, I, I know a participant um, who was so excited to join a study for influenza um, and really kind of and worked remotely. And this is something we've seen a lot, uh, particularly post pandemic. Uh, and if the Wi Fi sucks, you know, you're kind of out of luck, right? If you're in the back corner and you can't do your job, you're cut off from the rest of the world. That's actually a really serious ethical concern. And it's obviously not the job of the IRB to uh, do a site inspection of every place, but it is also intuitively true that if you know you were in a slum or in some sort of like rundown shack outside back of the hospital, like that would be unacceptable as well. And so those daily conditions are often at the forefront of prospective participants' minds and something that seems to be kind of a, a, a little bit less of a given um, from research oversight, maybe just because the assumption is that um, you know, the justified assumption is that for the most part, it works out pretty fine. Um, things like convenience, transparency, and communication, um, even just around dates, uh, changes to the protocol, um, assumptions about what can and cannot be said to participants or what participants understand. Uh, there's a lot of frustration, I think, um, about even just not getting dates. Like, dates are a really good example, um, a lack of information about compensation, um, and then results dissemination. This is one that's pretty frustrating. Uh, it is really well established in the literature that there's a significant subset of participants who care a lot about learning where their research went. Um, and it's pretty easy to do, and it's just something that the very few studies, relatively speaking, I definitely a minority do. Um, and I, to give you an example, I have a coworker who was infected with malaria uh, years ago, uh, and that was a challenge trial that helped select the adjuvant for the now very successful R21 vaccine that is about to be rolled out, uh, and is positioned to save thousands and thousands, many, many lives in Africa from malaria. He has no idea, he would have no idea that he was in the study that was really critical to uh, selecting that adjuvant because he just wasn't told. Um, it is, uh, I learned about these, you know, I learned about my Shigella study outcome and the, you know, the failure of that vaccine via the professional networks that I now have. Um, but it's not that hard to kind of tell people what happened, whether it's good or bad, and it could be as simple as an email. Overlap here is, is there's a little bit of an asterisk. So risk, uh, there's a balance and a personal kind of view of risk. So as we've heard, uh, you were really concerned about the balance of risk, net benefit, um, you know, risk, pers uh, you know, personal benefits and societal benefits. Those are the, the the language in which IRBs tend to think and research oversight tend to, tends to think about risk. That is not how participants tend to think about risk. Obviously, it is very personal. Um, what is the risk to me? And risk is a, often ends up being a catch-all phrase for, the, you know, what are the bad things that are going to happen? 
um, long-term risk, short-term risk, things like that. Uh, and then compensation. Um, yeah, this is a, I, I, there's very few places I think where there's a larger divergence in the compensation issue. Uh, and I'll try not to monologue too much on it, but um, to most participants, when you explain that, you know, uh, most participants often tend to assume that the compensation is set by budgetary limits. And when they learn that it's actually be, sometimes because of very real and, and intensive studies, because of a, an assumption that they are not competent enough or that there's a risk that they are so tempted by the money involved that they lose their rational capacity, they get very angry. And that I, I count myself in that category. When I first learned of this, this concept um, uh, after my Shigella, after I recovered from Shigellosis, Shigellosis uh, acutely and was chatting with the the very kind doctor who infected me, um, I, I was oh, flummoxed, frankly. Uh, and I don't doubt for a moment the sincerity and the genuine concern on pe behalf of people who you know are worried about exploitation of volunteers or coercion or things like that. But I do think that the way that compensation is approached um, in research oversight is pretty profoundly mistaken uh, and that it does actually a lot of harm to participants. So, uh, Some potential solutions to this and trying to overlap a little more include involving uh, involving gems. Oh, God. Uh oh, am I still uh, available here? Am I back? Okay. Whoops. Looks like I'm back for the most part. So sorry, like I said, I'm also, okay, so are we good? I'm gonna wait for a chat thing from Okay, so we're gonna <laughs> try that again. Um, so hopefully that cleared up again. Um, I'm incompetent at Zoom having been stuck on Teams for a while. So I'm gonna see, it looks like we're good. Um, so anyway, trying to get those Venn diagrams to overlap a little bit more. Uh, so my dream is sort of to have participants treated as partners in the process. Uh, and a really good example of that is how we've approached hepatitis C uh, controlled human infection models. And uh, the advisory board includes people who have been in human challenge trials, uh, people who have lived with hepatitis C, advocates from, uh, advocates from affected communities. Um, it involves really substantial direct feedback on the protocol, not just kind of like looking over informed consent documents or advertising or things like that. Uh, it, it is really, really deep and requires you know, work on part of the researchers to, to make that legible to us, right? And to explain to us what's going on. Um, and uh, one thing that has come from those discussions with the hepatitis C uh, advisory board in particular has been that there, it's, you know, it's possible to have elevated levels of risk if, if, if informed consent is done well. Um, and that inc could include uh, unknown risks. It's one thing I concur with, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Menikoff and Singer that this is a pretty, that, that is something that can still be done ethically and, and rationally, and rationally, I should say. Um, so some final kind of advice from the perspective, uh, perspective uh, as you know, Singapore you know, seeks to embark on human challenge studies, um, I really can think about what is necessary to cultivate a community of former human challenge participants as a resource. Uh, and that can be really simple. Uh, we've had issues before where because of the wording of informed consent uh, and contact like and privacy clauses that you just cannot reach out to former participants. So you might have a, a you know cornucopia of volunteers with really rich varied experience and you can't talk to them <laughs> you can't send them an email because uh the very legalistic reading of your informed consent documents say that you just can't do that um and as a, on a level of shameless self-promotion wendy senior is always really excited to kind of help on this um and to help put those communities together particularly in places where um there's not an existing you know body of volunteers who have done something like this in country so that is overall kind of my spiel on the more practical side. Um, here are some of the things that I have found particularly influential and useful, uh, well, one of my wrote, but uh, the others I found particularly useful and influential in terms of um, some of the issues that I spoke of. Uh, hopefully uh, I wasn't too choppy there. I apologize again, I've been pulled out of country, but uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, being invited here and really looking forward to the panel as well. We have two microphones um, if you would like to uh, address your questions to the panel. Um, just as a note, uh, we are recording this session um, for those who, who can't attend. Um, yeah, so, so the questions might be captured in some of these recordings. Um, yeah, and, um, and when you do, if you do ask your question, uh, it would be good to just introduce yourself briefly so we know where you're coming from. Yeah, let's get settled. Oh, it's actually not on. <laughs> so. So I'm oh, not sure if you know what I used that. So uh, how much should how much should Singapore pay uh, challenge study participants? What's your model for payment if they were to improve? Because not only you know is it confusing and, and insulting to uh, competent people, it's also exploitation, arguably, of getting people who are doing this for money. 
to take risks that are not properly compensated. So how, how do you think that should be played? Right. Um, that's a great question. I'm not so brave as to, to spit out a model off the top of my head. <laughs> and I really appreciate the work that's been done, though, um, trying to simulate that. What I will say, we're kind of in the process of collecting data at this point, but what is very clear to us, at least comparing even phase one drug research, is that it often pays substantially less than uh, human challenge trials, um, even though the, uh, yeah, which leads to some really, it's very counterintuitive. Um, I would say that my baseline is uh, whatever, uh, one way that institutions can know that they are paying too little, I can say, is uh, if they're just not recruiting quickly. I'm aware of cohorts of, uh, you know, in facilities that can, hold 28, 30 people running four at a time because there's a because the uh, REB or REB an institution refuses to pay anymore uh, on account, not account of budget issues, but because of uh, undue influence concerns. Um, which again, I want to emphasize, I don't doubt the sincerity and the genuine concern that exists there, but I think that that operationalizes in a very bad way um, because what ends up happening is you just draw from the uh, lowest socioeconomic strata of society. You're pushing the problem of undue inducement down the socioeconomic ladder. You're not actually solving anything. So my kind of cop-out answer is I don't have a fancy formula. Um, people are really, you know, people justifiably I think sometimes get a little scared by the phrase market or the word market. But the baseline is, uh, are you paying as much as the CROs down the street that are often paying much more than you for much less intensive research because they have a budget deadline, they have deadlines with their, their, you know, uh, their clients and they need to get people in the door. And if you're not, then, uh, should probably sit there and think, okay, we either think that the CRO is or whoever is doing something vastly unethical or that maybe we're underpaying. So my baseline would be make sure that it's enough to get through people, people through the door. That's maybe an argument that makes more sense now where in the United States, you know, labor rate participation rates are really low and it's like really hard to find people hire for anything. Um, we would definitely want to avoid a situation where, you know, post-recession, large amounts of job business people are uh, you can, you know, push rates back down again, push compensation. So that's kind of my, 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 you know, the go-to answer I have. Um, socioeconomic circumstances in every country are different, but the baseline is definitely uh, uh, you need to make sure that you're recruiting at a reasonable pace. And I don't think that that is, a, and I think that's just the bare minimum. Without commenting on how much people should be paid, it is interesting how, how often, in terms of the world of protecting research subjects, IRBs and those sorts of review committees uh, are spending a lot of time looking at payments and trying to figure out if they're too high. And right, exactly on the issue of undue inducement, because this is common in, in these sorts of rules around the world, you shouldn't have done the inducement. And the bottom line is, if you compare that issue to anywhere else in the world where we pay people to do things. Nobody worries about paying people too much. So why do we have all of these being basically told, well, you have to worry all the time about undue inducement. We shouldn't worry about paying too much. We should be thankful that the people who are in the research study are actually paying people enough. That's at least the limit the R&D is being in the world spending so much of the time saying, well, gee, four hundred dollars is too much, but you only get three million dollars. Uh, I wanted to query the panel uh, a bit more on the question of informed consent. Uh, and then we can do a notice about you know, the power of wealth in the process. And this is voluntary. What I wanted to ask was do uh, folks think that the process is basically, can be equivalent to any other clinical trial? The same standards be applied, the same kind of thing. You know, or are challenge trials essentially different in how uh, we should be having sort of a sort of higher standard or higher expectation of understanding, maybe more in depth, you know, uh, knowledge checks or, or other methods, or more in the same standard we apply to all clinical trials that is sufficient to ensure adequate informed consent? So, um, from my experience, I think it's probably adequate. Um, for instance, with the current challenges, I think there was a quiz, the volunteers were informed of the um, study, um, the risks that were being undertaken, and so for those more complex, more complex studies, I think there's a, there's a quiz that volunteers take to check their understanding. So 
I, I don't have too much knowledge around other clinical trials, but for you in charge, I, I suspect it's sufficient. Yeah, I, I don't think the standards have to be higher. Um, I think in clinical trials where you have a patient and the patient's physician maybe suggests that they might like to take part, um, often the, the sense of duress or pressure may be, may be greater. You know, you want to please your physician or you're ill and you want to seize any chance of continuing to live if you have a terminal illness. Um, so I don't see why you would want to require a higher standard of people who are simply volunteering and less likely to be under duress than, than those in the clinical trial. Maybe there are some circumstances I haven't thought of, but you know, normally I would say that. Another aspect of the present thing is on. I'm wondering the joint engine will formulate your regard to think about um, the benefits of society, benefits of individuals, and the other side of the equation is sort of risks to individuals. But there's a, a fourth benefit variable, which is risks to society. Right? And, and so one kind of concern in some instances with challenge trials, um, I've seen this in, in some previous reports, this was a concern uh, for a proposed that was going to fall through a challenge trial for the Zika virus back in the that country. What's the concern that during the course of a challenge trial, it goes Pathogen and there could be leakage. And so it could actually lead to the pathogen escaping the laboratory, um, and or you know, escaping the laboratory could be latent in the participants, and after they are released, um, even though it would be the best to ensure lack of infectiousness, there might be some individuals who nevertheless have some infectiousness and could cause a risk. So then that's, uh, that's to say that this was discussed in some of these discussions, some of these reports about challenge trials. So, with that in view, um, I understand there are procedures, of course, to minimize these. Uh, but does that sort of change the, the risk equation compared to maybe normal trials? Or is this something that, again, is, is uh, part of the course for clinical um, trials and is not going to change the change? Yeah. Um, it's a great issue, Ron. Um, interestingly, here in Singapore, the bio risk community, the people who are in charge of them, uh, level three labs or whatever, we actually had a big meeting like two weeks ago and, and we're talking about this sort of issue. Uh, the rules for protecting research subjects, IRBs, that kind of stuff, for, unfortunately don't actually build in a lot of direct issues related to protecting third parties. But there's certainly an awareness of that and I think it's certainly a reasonable thing to think about. Um, on the U.S. side, in fact, the advisory committee that advises the part of the government that deals with that uh, actually came out with, a, you know, a, a white paper, whatever it is, a year or two ago on exactly this issue. We should worry more about third parties other than the subjects, and, and it, it really depends. I mean, it was an interesting discussion, again, at that meeting two weeks ago or so about Right, how the bio-risk community is recognizing more and more risks to the public in general. I think there, was, there have been like newspaper reports about concerns about AI and how AI might be involved in terms of you know, dual-use things where you're designing some new drug or whatever it is, and now AI may make it easier to figure out ways to do bad things, to attack people with, with new drugs and that sort of thing. So I think it's a, a very, very relevant issue. I have some yeah, thoughts about that. Sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 I think you know, you're very, 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 very oh, can't really show sort of aspect of that too, but primarily is the one. The Zika is a way to make it because of the concern of the transition of the others. And, and uh, uh, not the Zika is a subsection. It can be a very, 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 And I think that there was probably, I think it was probably a little bit too conservative in many ways. Um, it, quickly became clear that there are ways to control that. Uh, you know, that it requires a close partnership with participants. Um, but I don't think that it is, uh, I think what I took away after my own participation was that the way we think about risk to third parties in um, this quote unquote profession is 
often very different from how we think about it in most other contexts in the world. Uh, all of which is to say that there is a sort of, uh, I think, you know, it's very important to consider that you don't, you know, infect others with a disease against their will. Um, but I mean, underlying a lot of this uh, is the fact that, for instance, at least in the United States, you can't detain someone against their will. So it was entirely possible that someone in the United States uh, in a Shigella challenge, for instance, decided that they wanted to leave and you cannot literally force them to stay. They could infect others. And there were measures in the study to make sure that uh, that if that were to happen, they weren't living with, you know, people who are under the age of five or over the age of 65. Um, so overall, I think that it, it's uh, definitely valid to sort of protect people who to, to try to protect third parties. Um, but it definitely would not be the case that, uh, you know, even relatively small, minute risk of, of uh, infection of third parties was enough, is enough to um, negate the you know, possibility of doing a challenge study altogether. Well, just, just a couple of, of further comments. Um, Jake just said you can't detain someone against their will, at least in the United States, but you can have lockdowns, say for COVID, and they require people to stay in their homes or um, perhaps, you know, if they're already in an institution, maybe to stay in that institution. There were certainly cases of people who were dying and knew they were dying, um, who could not be in contact with their family. They couldn't leave the hospitals during lockdown. I'm talking about Australia now, but I think it happened in other cases. Um, uh, and, their, and their relatives couldn't go and see them. Uh, so there's all sorts of things that we do to minimize risk, and I suppose if the risk was a serious one, um, you could do something like that. Um, as we've been talking about Zika, and Jake, Jake has been talking about that, um, if I remember correctly, uh, Zika started to be um, present in Brazil just at a time when, uh, was it the World Cup was being held in, in Brazil, and there were some thoughts that maybe it wasn't a great idea to have millions of visitors coming into Brazil to uh, be spectators at the World Cup um, when they might get Zika and take it out again, take it back to their home countries. But, you know, the World Cup was too important to cancel because of that risk. So if, if that's true for that, then, um, you know, maybe there are other risks in order to get an effective vaccine, which you would also be willing to run. On this thread um, about you know potentially needing to whether or not we should be um, allowing individuals to be uh, under some degree of quarantine uh, during the uh, during uh, during the challenge trial. So one of the pillars of research ethics, reflected in various laws and regulations, that I think was mentioned in one of Shabana's slides, is the right to withdraw, the right to withdraw from research without penalty at any time. Right, it's a pretty standard document. But in the case of a challenge trial, um, there might be circumstances, though it depends on the challenge trial and. and details when if someone is you know, already been agreed and they've consented but then after a few days after already been exposed to the pathogen to say I don't want to be part of this anymore right? I want to go home you know I, I want to do, do this and that right now again it depends on whether on the um, infectious disease condition whether or not that can be abided by but for certain challenge trials where there is a higher risk um, of infecting third parties um, should we actually provide an exception to the right to withdraw from research or is there no need is there a way of, of respecting the right to withdraw uh, while still protecting third parties uh, from infection. So I think you still need to respect the right to be able to withdraw from the study, even if a volunteer has been challenged. I think um, with experience with HB, though, uh, when we've had volunteers that wanted to leave after being challenged with the respiratory virus, we've transported them home in a private vehicle. We've arranged for PIs to go visit them on a daily basis. We've e educated them with individuals that they shouldn't be coming in contact with. We've tried to ensure that they've had shopping delivered with them so they don't have to leave their homes. We've tried to make everything there so that the third party risk is minimized as much as possible. And I think, I think that's uh, something that the study teams need to be thinking about. And, and so, yeah, you, you wouldn't be able to stop someone from leaving your study. Yeah, so another aspect of this it raises interesting issues relating to what it means to withdraw. So often when somebody wants to withdraw, like for example from a clinical trial, they're objecting to continually taking or to continue taking the drug, for example. But on the other hand, there may be other aspects of the clinical trial that it's perfectly appropriate to force them to continue to participate in. One example is continuing to collect data, for example, about what's happening to their health. Um, in, in terms of in the US, for example, uh, trials that are under the Food and Drug Administration, FDA approval, 
Uh, there were rules that basically, for example, if you wanted data removed about yourself, the rules will not allow that to be removed because FDA needs the data to, to determine whether a product gets approved, that sort of thing. So I think there's a more nuanced notion about what it means when somebody wants to say they don't want to participate, and often we can continue to empower them for the things that are most important to them in terms of, well, I don't want to continue to be exposed to this drug. I want to stop taking it. But Im impose you know, the government's interest, the public interest, in terms of other aspects of the trial that they cannot actually aim their participation in. Thanks. And just, uh, just want to check um, if there are any questions from the floor. Again, there's the two mi microphones there, if anyone had any, any questions before. I yeah, there's a question there. OK. Please do use the microphone. Hi, I'm Irene Ho, former journalist. I'm a writer and a coach and an editor. And I was just wondering when this conversation was going on, what happens, for instance, if, and this applies only to women, what happens if a subject becomes pregnant in the course of a trial? Um, that's a pretty good question. Um, I'm just trying to to think. Uh, so with the child studies that uh, we've been involved in or I've been involved in, um, usually we take female volunteers who are taking contraception and, and, fu and fully educated around the studies and the risks to becoming pregnant. Um, and then they're followed up following discharge from the study. Um, I haven't come across an individual that's become pregnant following discharge from the study, so I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if if anyone else on the panel wants to comment. Yeah, I can speak to what I know from some of the best I've spoken with and the uh, informed consent process. Um, really heavy emphasis, regardless of the disease. Obviously, for something like Zika, it'd be pretty intense, but uh, intense emphasis, but uh, really strong emphasis that you should not be getting pregnant, trying to get pregnant during human challenge study. Um, that does not seem to weigh really heavily on a lot of us here's minds. Not that it doesn't matter because it is pretty well understood by participants. Um, and there's a alignment of interest uh, where you really do not want to get pregnant if you are you know, being uh, challenged with a disease. Um, but I mean, it ultimately does come down to, to, in some cases, to trust. You have to trust that someone does, in fact, have an IUD, is using contraception uh, or hormonal birth control. Um, in some cases, you can trust but verify, but there is a uh, there's a level of trust involved there, but to my knowledge, it is a very heavily emphasized within studies that this is a problem, uh, or that this is a, like, this is a problem if you get pregnant and you should avoid it at all costs. Um, but also, yeah, I, I, I can't speak to other probably institutional differences and in how an actual piece of pregnancy would be handled, uh, depending on the challenge agent, you know, the institution itself. Maybe we can return to this question in the second half. Uh, maybe Dr. Barney Young can also shed some light on, on some of the procedures and protections in place uh, in practice for. Uh, cases of, of unintended pregnancy during a challenge trial. Other questions from the floor? Um, if not, um, I might try and query um, a kind of train of thought um, that was being developed, uh, particularly uh, from Jake's uh, wonderful uh, discussion of what participants really care about. And that relates to making sure that the benefits of a trial actually do accrue to the relevant parties. And, and I was wondering, there's a question of responsibility for this, and especially, well, you know, who, whose job is it, so to speak, to ensure this? Uh, to ensure, for example, that um, results from a trial don't just get put on a shelf and, and, and not used. Um, and also, I guess, related is the dissemination of results, including participants and others. Um, so one of the other thoughts, should IRBs, institutional review boards, actually be checking about um, plans for dissemination uh, of results, either to participants or the community at large? Or is that really the job of researchers or institutions? If you think this is ethically important, well, who's going to take the responsibility to carry out this ethical of, of dissemination of results, either positive or negative? So speaking as a funder, <laughs> I, do, I do think potentially that this is something that the funders could do. We do have... Um, we have uh, terms and conditions as part of our funding agreements, and, and part of that is to ensure that the data produced in these challenge studies are freely available, but maybe there is something there around disseminating the, the findings back to the volunteer population. And that's really key. I think that it you know, builds trust with the community and enables um, further studies to be able to be conducted successfully. 
I think it's important to emphasize as well that it's not uh, hard. You don't have to upload a lot of complicated data to your database. You don't have to send them the full paper. It can be a couple paragraphs in the email. Like it really does not have to be a full production. And I think that sometimes the way people get a little bit nervous about it, thinking it has to be you know, a full, fully written paper uh, or a really in-depth PowerPoint. It, 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 if you want to do that, by all means, go for it, I would say to PIs, but just email. Again, if, you know, if the vaccine that you were part of uh, the trial for early on is now you know, getting shipped out to Sub-Saharan Africa to save maybe millions of lives, like, yeah, send someone an email, link to the news article and say, you were part of this research process. A paragraph or two. It is not. Uh, that's. I think one of the reasons I we were always so surprised by the lack of dissemination of, of research is just the the this the kind of glaring um, disparity between how hard it is to do and then how uh, averse people seem to be to do it. Uh, I mean, just continuing that theme, uh, even on the side of the IRBs, I think there is a development. I'm not sure whether, how much of it is regulatory, how much of it is, is other ways of dealing with this, but there is a theme now recognizing that even the IRBs, in terms of the submissions, you know, the protocol, whatever else, that this issue is, is legitimately raised, that there should be a plan for disseminating results, including to the participants. This is part of appropriately respecting the participants, and therefore it is more and more expected that you will be, you'll be dealing with that in one way or another. Okay. Um, picking up on another thread that was discussed in, in some of the, the talks, um, there's this issue of uncertainty. And, and this is contextually relevant, um, depends on, of course, where we are in, in the context of an outbreak. Uh, but you know, early on with the COVID-19 outbreak, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot, a, a lot of um, concern about, uh, for example, you know, the, the, the uh, conditions under which someone might be, their life might be at risk, um, and the conditions under which someone might be particularly at risk of harm if they were infected, if the COVID-19 challenge trial were put forward very early on during the pandemic, as was sometimes proposed by, by some of us here. Um, so, you know, th there's different ways that we can react to uncertainty, uh, risk that is uncertain, right? And so one approach, um, all the alternative to the approaches that I think, um, you know, was put forward here is, is a precautionary approach. One approach is, well, when risks are uncertain, we should be a little more careful. Sometimes the word conservative was used. Um, you know, we should, we should you know, uh, err on the side of caution when the risks are uncertain, when the risks might be much greater than we realize. When, and, you know, the downside risk sometimes that if you end up having um, some individuals uh, who actually are severely harmed by a challenge trial, not only could harm that individual, but could undermine public trust, right? So if it turned out someone was really harmed in a challenge trial because you, you, you embarked very quickly on it, maybe it would undermine the possibility of running further trials later on because people are concerned about, about that kind of excess risk. What, what, what do you think of that kind of counter precautionary approach uh, in light of these uh, particularly uncertain risks, maybe at the beginnings of, of disease outbreaks, a novel disease outbreak? Um, I would go back to the, the principle of risk parity that I mentioned here, because if in the early days of COVID we were maybe rather uncertain about what the harms of a human challenge trial would be, but we must be at least equally uncertain about what the harms to healthcare workers will be, because you know, if, if, if in fact it turns out that we are seriously harming the participants in the human challenge trial because COVID is likely to be, you know, very serious, serious risk even to the young and healthy volunteers who we have, and even when they're getting the best medical supervision and attention available, then it seems likely that it's, it's going to be very dangerous to the community as a whole, very dangerous to the healthcare workers, not all of whom will be young and healthy. Um, and you know, the, the figures that I quoted, that it was, in fact, it killed about 20,000 people per day, um, at least in the first two years, um, might have been you know, far more than that. Right? And, and there were such fears at the time that, that COVID was going to be more dangerous and that it was going to kill um, many more people even than it did. So um, I think that uh, that simply means that the benefit is, is much greater. And although we can't know those risks in advance, if we explain to people that we don't know that there might be a serious risk and they still give their informed consent, uh, I think it's justified to, to go ahead with it. So um, in terms of the COVID challenge study, um, in fact, those discussions happened very early on. I think the pandemic was announced in March 2020 and the conversations around whether to establish a COVID challenge began in, towards the end of April. 
Um, and what I'd say is, um, I think there was a lot of discussions with ethics, uh, ethicists, regulators, funders, um, and the researchers about how to safely um, establish a COVID challenge study. And what, I, what I'd also kind of say is that there was a lot of reticence around how to, where to produce the challenge agent. There were a lot of manufacturers that were taken up with producing the COVID vaccine uh, and not able to take on producing the challenge agent. Um, there was reticence amongst the funders to be able to fund the research. Um, so there was, a, I think the team did a lot of work um, to to gain interest to to gather the gather the um, gather everyone together to be able to move forward with that COVID challenge study that the imperial team set up. I'd also say that you know um, with the influenza challenge study that I mentioned during my talk, um, where a volunteer had mild cardiac enzymes, that happened in the US and that actually stopped flu challenge studies in the US for nearly a decade. So it does have wider repercussions if there is an issue with the challenge study. Thanks. Um, I think we have a few more minutes uh, for some final points. But one thing I'd like to turn, maybe particularly for Jake, but also anyone else can address this, and thinking again about this question of community engagement, uh, community participation, community uh, involvement in, in research. And, and you know, in Singapore, um, uh, we have uh, you know, some experience in this regard, but there's always more um, that can be done. I was wondering, in advice that Jake might have, but others, others as well, if a researcher were say, were, you know, who is not maybe um, as well versed in community involvement in reaching out to communities, um, you know, what are, and, and can be quite resource intensive, right? We don't have the infrastructure built up, you know, um, of, of spending time of, of, of personnel, reaching out to developing communities, um, of bringing them into into study team or involved in various committees. So any, any kind of words of advice, practically speaking, um, to, to researchers or funders, um, concerning maybe the, you know, the, the advantages um, and also the practical aspects of, of you know, uh, ramping up community involvement in research, maybe particularly for, for challenge trials. Yeah, uh, well, so I'm not going to say the first one should be to reach out to my email and, and you know, bring one day soon. But uh, more broadly, you know, it's, it's tricky, right, because there's no constituency for the healthy participant in the same way that there are for, you know, patient trials. Um, and so one thing that one senior aspires to be is, is sort of the standard for that um, in the same way that you kind of have patient advocacy groups, but with very kind of different goals. Uh, but I think that, you know, the and in many ways, it is also, uh, I would say, broadly speaking, it is, it is sometimes even pathogen specific. You know, I brought up the hepatitis C chim example. Um, that is one where we tried to bring in people who had you know, previously had chronic infection with hepatitis C that they cleared on their own. Um, people who uh, have been incarcerated um, or who formerly injected drugs, uh, both of those being really high uh, high incidence groups for hepatitis C, along with people like me who have been in human challenge studies for other diseases, um, since there's not been an established hepatitis C human challenge model yet. So I think that uh, it does not have to be, um, you know, extremely extensive in the way that it doesn't have to be incredibly resource intensive uh, in many ways. I think that um, whether it's a community advisory board um, or some other format or mechanism, uh, as long as you're bringing at least some representatives from stakeholders to the table uh, for, especially if it's a disease of, of a more niche relevance, it's that's can be extremely useful. Uh, and if not, you know, I think that whether, for instance, if it's COVID or a respiratory disease that circulates widely, um, you can draw from a pretty wide uh, population. I don't think, and I think you know, uh, interaction with media and government is also relevant there. But um, I don't think this is quite the instance where you need to go in and you know canvas door to door uh, to try to figure out the ethical acceptability. But um, yeah, in many ways, it is pretty context specific for a given disease or pathogen. So our final comments. Any other panelists want to bring to bear on this topic? Um, I just want to come back to the question of the reticence uh, that you mentioned, Shaman, and in terms of the early days of, of COVID. Um, and I'd, I'd actually like to get Jake's views on this as well, but anyone else? I mean, it did seem to me, and I'm certainly a lay person here, I'm not in, you know, inside the field as you are, that an opportunity was missed, that, that the actual human challenge trials were conducted only after we had um, vaccines and that we could have speeded up the availability of vaccines had we used the volunteers who were available through one day sooner or, or elsewhere. Uh, so I, w I wonder whether anybody else you know, f feels that. that Yes, there were, there were reasons for the reticence, as you explained, um, and they might have been difficult to overcome, but uh, nevertheless, it seems to me that it would have been better if they had been overcome. 
So I think one of the rate limiting steps was the production of the challenge agent. Um, that was produced under GMP conditions and actually the team who produced that did that in record time. So within a year of actually having the discussions, there was the challenge agent produced and the um, first infection had taken place. And I, and I think that was the right, the right uh, way to, to move forward. I would say from our perspective, uh, what we kind of pivoted to pretty quickly as it became clear that uh, whether there's Operation Warp Seed in the United States um, or you know, uh, other kind of civil government programs abroad showed uh, really great promise early on for large scale, rapid, uh, streamlined phase three testing. Uh, we, we kind of pivoted to, uh, we, we, we started to emphasize that there was what we call the second strike capability. So imagine that AstraZeneca, Pfizer, you know, BioNTech, Moderna had not worked as phenomenally well as they did uh, at the end of the, those phase three studies. Uh, we're left then with hundreds of candidates uh, and we need to down select very rapidly. So I think that is one other way in which we kind of viewed early on the use of COVID challenge. Um, so I'm not sure how that quite, I'm not sure how much that has bearing on the reticence aspect of it, but I think that if people, um, I, I think early on we tried to make it clear to participants as well and prospective volunteers that um, there was a lot more that could be gained in terms of basic knowledge, whether, uh, and, and even after, you know, GMP production of the challenge agent had been achieved, um, uh, uh, that had a scientific value. And so it doesn't even, I don't think it necess necessitates um, a hundred percent, you know, the, uh, doesn't, it does not necessarily need to be the case that, you know, it was just straightforward. If we had done challenge, this vaccine would have come, you know, one day sooner. Um, to even kind of make the argument, I think they think there was still a strong, you know, compelling scientific argument. I think that was one that, um, you know, resonated with our participants a lot who signed up with us, and I think still had a lot of sway. It was virtually not covered, and maybe as much in media, and maybe that would have uh, overcome some reticence and some concern from others. But uh, that was, yeah, that was kind of how we approached the problem. Can I just also add that when the discussion started, it was very early on, right? So it was April 2020. There was still a lot of data coming through around how the virus was being transmitted, the potential mortality. Um, and I think the, the study team did a lot of work gathering that data and using um, hospital systems that weren't set up to, to provide that information to researchers. So I, I don't know that it could have been accelerated any faster than it, than it was done. Thanks very much. We'll return again to the COVID-19 context in a little more detail in the second half. But for, for now, I think uh, I want to thank again our panelists, um, uh, both physical and, and, and virtual, for the in insights uh, into the challenges of challenge trials uh, and, and how we can address those. Um, and so we are gonna, now going to take a tea break uh, until about, I think, 11.15 when we convene with our second half. So thanks again to our panelists uh, and to the audience for your participation.